Tilly Hill is an interesting character, and to be honest, she's probably the best parent possibly besides Doc Platter, seeing as she's light years better than either Cotton or Maddie Platter. Wait, Cotton's trying to pin this on me? It was his idea to go to New York. What? Well, then one of you is not telling the truth. Ah, oh, hell, I know it's him. Hey folks, welcome to Squirrel Tactics. Don't forget to give a like and subscribe if you haven't already. And of course, don't forget to check out our Patreon and our sister channel. Anywho, let's do this. Matilda May Garrison, better known as Tilly Hill, the ex-wife of Cotton, current wife of Chuck, and mother to Hank. Which is pretty obvious considering they look ridiculously alike. Now, she's actually had at least four voice actors. Her first appearance in Halloween never actually lists who does her voice. Oh my, aren't you boys the scariest? Yeah, man, talk about wah ha 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 Dang old boo, man. You got any candy cigarettes? No, but I have chocolate. Happy Halloween. But considering the fact that she sounds just like Leanne, I'm going to go ahead and say that it was Pamela Adlin. Her official voice actors are Tammy Wynette, yes, possibly the most influential female country artist of all time, Tammy Wynette. However, she passed away after a few appearances and was replaced with character actress Beth Grant, who would eventually be replaced herself with Kay Callan for Tilly's final three appearances. We don't know how or when Tilly and Cotton got together other than that it was after the war and we know they're divorced and that Tilly left him and initiated the divorce but we don't know when. We see in Escape from Party Island that they were still together when Hank was in high school and Cotton decided to demonstrate the proper procedure for washing dishes. How helps you with your dishes? Mom? Mom, what should I do? Mom! We also get a peek into their marriage in the unbearable blindness of laying. Grub a dub dub, I think I'm in love. As well as in Yankee Hanky. It was unseasonably warm that day, and all I wanted was a glass of water. Suck on up, Pamela, and keep looking storked up. You're our ticket through the police line. When we learned that Hank was born not only in New York. Three days later, we took a premature bundle of you back to Texas. I never told you because I didn't think you were man enough to handle it. Not being born in Texas, you weren't! But also in a women's bathroom in Yankee Stadium after a failed assassination attempt on Fidel Castro. Have a cigar, you weak chin Cuban son of a bitch! We also get to see her freak out a bit on the phone with Hank when he calls to ask about his birth certificate. Your birth certificate? Well, what makes you think I'd have something like that? Because I wouldn't. And I don't. Well, that was weird. She pops up here and there, like when Hank needed a woman or at least some womanly advice because Connie was having her first period in aisle 8A. Hello? Mm. Um. Hello? Ah. <sighs> By the way, Hank really did feel bad about that situation. I even hung up on my own mother. And she's such a nice woman. And we learn in Peggy's Turtle Song that at one point during Hank's childhood, she drove a cab. Don't you remember that year I drove a taxi? No. Well, wait a minute. I remember you had a yellow car when I was little. Her first full-on appearance, other than a flashback, is in The Unbearable Blindness of Lane, where she makes Hank uncomfortable at the airport. Oh, Hank, it's so good to see you. <clears throat> Mom, we're in public. One hand only, okay? But I've missed you. Thank you very much. Then she gets uncomfortable when discussing sleeping arrangements for Tilly and her boyfriend, Gary. Don't tell me you're uncomfortable with the thought of me and Gary sleeping in the same room. I didn't have that thought, Mom. You put that thought in my head. But now that it's there, you leave me no choice. I'm sorry. The next morning, Tilly turns down an invitation to watch an 8th grade boys basketball game after a long gary list night. <laughs> it's been a long night without your puppy. Mister, it's certainly been a long hot night. And because they forgot the proper foam finger, Hank walks in at the wrong time, and I do mean the wrong time. Oh, oh. 
this, of course, makes Hank go blind, and I don't think any of us can really blame him for that. We also get to see Peggy kind of freak out considering they did it on the kitchen table. I like them flat. Press harder. Oh. Peggy. So, okay. Who wants to make cookies? Other than that, she actually doesn't do a whole lot as there's more emphasis on Gary, who we will eventually get to with a video of his own. Her next appearance was in Nine Pretty Darn Angry Men, where she's having Thanksgiving with the Hills. You'll notice a lot of her appearances are holiday episodes. Halloween for Halloween, Peggy's Turtle Song for Mother's Day, The Unbearable Blindness of Laying, and Living on Reds, Vitamin C, and Propane are both Christmas episodes where she shows up. And Nine Pretty Darn Angry Men is a Thanksgiving episode. And if you count spring break as a holiday, that's when Escape from Party Island takes place. Anywho, Cotton breaks the agreed upon schedule of he and Tilly alternating holidays as to avoid each other, and we see why pretty quick. I ever tell you about the time she tried to poison me with a baked chicken? <sighs> it was chicken almondine. It was cyanide, woman! And the theme of the episode is Hank's failure to defend his mom to his dad. Huh, dad? Could you please show Mom some respect while Bobby's in the room? You heard him, Bobby. Leave the room. No, sit down, Bobby. With Cotton saying pretty much whatever he wants. Of course, better still he was in the kitchen. She was even worse in the bedroom. <gasps> I said the woman was lousy in the sack. And we see Hank being unlike Hank and folding like a lawn chair. Tilly and Dee Dee end up having a discussion about it, which I guess the two could easily bond over having to deal with Cotton. I'm sorry about all those things Cotton said about you. It doesn't mean anything. He just doesn't like you. Oh, I wouldn't mind Cotton's rantings if Hank would just stick up for me. Well, if it makes you feel any better, Hank doesn't stick up for me either. His own stepmother. The two of them end up walking in on Cotton, going on another tirade, this time during a focus group and in public. They said the ladies' room was the second door on the right, so this must be it. I'll tell you who get my vote. The guy who figures out a way to strap an old woman on an old mower and run them both off a cliff. Oh, he's doing it again. And in public. And she sees Hank finally stand up to Cotton about talking bad about her. If you ever talk about my mom or my mower like that again, you're not welcome in my house. Amen. With Cotton giving a typical Cotton response. <laughs> you got a fat neck, boy. Well, I'm not sure if there is a God or a heaven. But one thing I can tell you is your daddy's going to hell. But Tilly is rather happy about this going down. Have you thought about what you want for Christmas, Mom? I don't need anything from you, Hank. You've given me enough already. Also, even though it's a holiday episode and you figured they'd spend the holiday together, there's no Gary in this episode, nor is there even a mention of him. Same with her next appearance, Escape from Party Island, where she's leading a trip to Port Aransas in order to visit a museum of miniatures. Hank doesn't freak out when she gives him more than a handshake as a greeting, which is kind of odd. You know, you've still got four hours of driving before you get to Port Aransas. I'm not sure I want oh. you... And she apologizes for being later than expected. We stopped at the pancake house one thing just led to another blueberry pancakes mean blueberries in the pancakes not buttermilk grill cakes with blue sauce on top they brought you new ones that's not the point before introducing her friends this is lillian she's delicate pleased to meet you lillian oh. That was much too sudden. We learn in this episode that Tilly turned to her miniatures as a way to cope with her home life. I hate miniatures. I've hated them since I was a kid. Mom only took them out when she was heading into a funk, like between the time I was 10 and 14. Hank decides to drive them because he just doesn't trust Tilly on the road with a van, even though she made it all the way to Arlen from Arizona just fine. Enjoy your trip to the miniature museum, Hank. Hope you can fit inside. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> and the women in her group aren't exactly the easiest to get along with, but Tilly tries to play peacekeeper. Hey, just apologize to Delia. But I never said... Delia gets a little out of sorts when her blood sugar falls low. Otherwise, she's lovely. Here's a piece of hard candy, dear. Mmm. And they do end up making it to the island in one piece. Look, everyone. Port Aransas. It looks like a miniature island. Oh, it's a shame it has to get bigger. I want to remember it like this. They get a start bright and early the next morning. Oh, hurry. We're going to be late for the museum. It's not even... 5 a.m. That kind of attitude is not going to get you ready any faster. And we see that Hank just can't win when they get lunch. Six cucumber sandwiches, please. Uh, I'll have the hamburger sandwich instead. The cucumber sandwiches are delicious here. I don't like cucumber. <gasps> I apologize for my son. Come on, Mom. You don't have to apologize for me. Apparently, I do. Tilly and Hank have a conversation about the miniatures and how Tilly thinks they're happy because they know their home. Don't they look happy? They like it here. Huh. Mom, those are just glass. I know that, Hank. My point is, they're from the island and they like being home. This distresses Hank because it reminds him of how his mom acted when he was younger. Huh. You're not falling into one of those funks, are you, Mom? Because I haven't seen you, uh socialize with your miniatures since, gosh, since you were married to Dad. As I head back to the museum the next day, Tilly shows a little naivety. Oh, look at this crowd. That museum is going to be a madhouse. And then a lot more naivety. But hey, she finds herself a unicorn. Lots of people are apparently looking for those. Mom, that fella asked you to show him your high beams. Now, do you even know what he meant? Of course I do. I've been driving longer than you. No, Mom, what he meant was... Oh, Hank, look, a unicorn. I have just the little nook for you. Oh, yes, I do. Since Spring Breakers have taken over the town, Hank decides it's time to leave. There, you're packed. But we haven't seen the Glade of Elsinore at the museum. Forget about the museum. We've got to get off this island before they run out of beer and start rioting. But on their way to the ferry, Tilly realizes that she forgot her unicorn. My God, Hank, stop. Mom, I told you, I will not... Hank, stop this van. <sighs> what is it? Are you okay? No, I'm not. I'm not okay at all. I've left my unicorn. Oh. And she argues that she has to go back for it because of its rarity, like the real-life version. We have to go back for it. We'll miss the ferry. I can't. Hank, tiny glass unicorns are as hard to find as a real unicorn. I can't leave without mine. She and Hank argue over the unicorn and her love of miniatures, which leads to possibly the best line of the episode and Tilly getting out of the van. Now I've had enough, Mom. Forget the damn unicorn and all these stupid little dolls from when you went weird. Oh, Delia was right. Hank, you are impossible. Which one of you is Delia? She is. I could commit you like that. Hank goes back to the museum looking for her, but ends up having a conversation with Lyle Neff, who's not a real person, by the way. And this opens Hank's eyes up just a bit. Women come in here all the time, and they are sad, and they are lonely, and they are frumpy, and they tell me how my tiny, individually handcrafted, investment-grade art is the only thing keeping them sane. Do you understand? Does that sound like your mother? He finally accepts that the miniatures were a way for Tilly to cope with her life. So, uh, so this little... Glass crap really helped her out, huh? Huh, I guess I owe someone an apology. Accepted. Tilly is in the gift shop where Hank finds her, apologizes, and gives her a gift. Uh, it's the Los Angeles International Airport carved in a walnut shell. Oh, look at the detail. Don't worry, little puppy. Someone's coming to claim you. But luckily they're able to make it to the ferry and head back home. Look, everyone. Port Aransas. Oh, I can't wait to get there. Also, just a little side point here. Why is Dale randomly in the background at Port Aransas? Anywho, she appears at the beginning of I Don't Want to Wait. It's a much longer title, but I'm not going to say it. When Bobby spent the summer with her and Gary in Arizona. The old man came rolling home. <laughs> this is my place, Bobby. Home sweet home. Building 42, living space K. In case we get separated. 
and her birthday gift for Bobby isn't the best thing for someone turning 13. Happy birthday. A policeman's uniform, ages seven and up. We see a little bit of Tilly when she's at the hills after attending her best friend's funeral and Hank makes plans to deliver the antiques that Tilly was left in her friend's will and living on Red's vitamin C and propane. I don't know whether to laugh or cry. Uh, so your best bet is, you know, neither. Then we have her final appearance, the Honeymooners, where we see Hank give her a call, he apparently calls her every day, and tries to act like a scammer. Hank, is that you? No, it's Prince Jabari. Hank, if you need money, I can send you a check. I just got adorable ones. Covered bridges. Yeah, good going there, Hank. Didn't quite work. But Tilly does have some news. Oh, I have news. I'm getting married. Really? Well, that's great. I've always liked Gary. Any man who eats that much brisket can't be all bad. I find it odd that Gary would eat a lot of brisket considering he had to limit his red meat intake due to his heart condition, but, you know, whatever. Anywho, Hank gets a bit of a surprise. Oh, not to Gary. Gary and I broke up weeks ago. What? It's also odd that she wouldn't have already mentioned all of this if they talk every day. Then Hank gets an even bigger surprise. Why? He got paranoid, Hank. He was always snooping around. That's how he found out about me and Chuck. What? Who's Chuck? Yep, Tilly cheated on Gary and they broke up when he found out. But who's this Chuck fella? We met a couple of months ago. The wedding is next weekend. Hope you can make it, honey. Bye. Who's Chuck? So the Hills head out to Phoenix for the wedding, which is kind of hot, but it's a dry heat. Oh my God, it's like standing on the sun. This city should not exist. It is a monument to man's arrogance. Bobby's reaction here is really weird considering he's been to Arizona at least twice, once during the summer, so why is he so surprised at the heat? Also, that's possibly Peggy's best line of the series, so kudos there. They meet Chuck and learn that Tilly might be a tiny bit more adventurous than they had thought. Grandma, is this you parasailing? Yes, Chuck and I went to Mexico to celebrate his 70th birthday. Parasailing? Is that the kind of daredevil stuff you're into, Chuck? Actually, it was Tilly's idea. Hank wants to go for a ride with Chuck, where we find out that Tilly didn't tell Chuck about Gary, so he didn't know that she was cheating. But Tilly didn't tell me about Gary until after they broke up. And we learned what Hank's favorite nail is, you know, in case any of you actually want to know that. You know what my favorite nail is, Chuck? The three-penny fluted stainless steel. I don't know why. Tilly gets walked down the aisle by Hank, and they have a tender moment at the altar when Hank gives her away. Do you give this woman to be married to this man? I, uh, uh, well, uh, yes, I do. Tilly and Chuck then sell their condos to buy an RV in order to drive around the country for their retirement, which I'm not going to lie, that's not really a terrible idea. We sold our condos, Hank. We're going to spend our golden years zigzagging across the country. Woo! But Hank doesn't like it, and he blames Chuck. And yeah, Dale does not help the situation at all. You're right to be scared, Hank. RVs are a one-way ticket to meth addiction and KOA sites where the law has no meaning. Tilly is about to enter a world that she cannot change, but will change her. RVs and meth. Interesting. That kind of reminds me of something. Anywho, the Hills visit the RV for dinner, and we see that maybe getting married quickly and living in close quarters constantly might not be the best thing for Tilly and Chuck. Welcome to our home. Would you like the grand tour? Not so grand. This place makes my old one-bedroom condo look like the Hearst Castle. Not here. Not now. We see even more of this during Chuck's prayer. Thank you, God, for your bounty, which we are about to enjoy, and for protecting me and the other motorists from my wife's erratic driving. This RV is clearly too much car for her. We were all over the road. Amen. Message received. Potatoes, Mr. Slowpoke. And the two start to argue over their driving skills, which is really an argument over their differences at lifestyle preference. I'm a defensive driver. You should try it sometime. I like getting out of first gear. You should try that sometime. Yep. 
potatoes. Chuck is much more easygoing. This thing doesn't exactly stop on a dime, Tilly. Wow, look at that. You're showing some emotion. I thought I'd married a piece of driftwood. Emotion? Is that what led you to flip off that trucker? He chased us through two mesas. Whereas Tilly wants to push the envelope. She wants to live life to the fullest. And considering what she went through for all those years with cotton, yeah, I kind of get it. Chuck, it has been two weeks. Admit it. You need a prescription. Not everyone's libido is the same. They keep on arguing. Well, now we can drive to Hearst Castle. Are you kidding? The Exxon Valdez here only gets three feet per gallon. We'll be lucky to make it to the nearest White Castle. And Hank has a talk with Chuck, where he learns that the RV was actually Tilly's idea and that she's not quite who Hank thought she was. Mom never mentioned wanting an RV. Your mom has something of a wild streak, Hank. It's part of why I fell for her. The parasailing, midnight swims at the condo, Uggs. I just wish Tilly and I could get our old life back. Hank, Peggy, and Chuck sit down and decide it's best if they sell the RV and buy a local condo, but Tilly is not on board, especially considering the fact that they decided all of this without her input and decide that they're going to tell her what to do. And you're part of this? I think it's for the best. Well, I don't, and I'll thank you all to keep your noses out of my business. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to my RV. You know it's moments like this that really remind me how alike Peggy and Tilly are. You could certainly say that Hank married his mother. She goes back to the RV and kicks Chuck out for the night. Honey! Your pajamas and your weird pillow will be on the lawn. It's not weird. It's memory foam. But the next morning, Chuck has a plan to get back into Tilly's good graces and the RV. I haven't known your mom long, but I know she can't stay mad when she's eating poached eggs. Toast points. You are pitching some woo, Chuck Garrison. But Tilly and the RV are both gone, seeing as Tilly decided to go on her own adventure. Jackass. She ends up stopping to grab a bite to eat, ordering her dessert to be brought out before her meal. I'll have a tuna melt and some strawberry rhubarb pie. Oh, but bring the pie first. I like you. You're a hot ticket. And we see a little bit more of her naivety. If you're heading out to see the wildflowers off Route 9, make sure you have four-wheel drive. The access road is bumpy. Oh, yes. I've got four wheels. <laughs> hot ticket. Hank and Chuck head out to look for her, sharing stories of Tilly not being the brightest bulb on the tree. On the way to your place, she dumped the RV septic over a bridge. The people on the ferry were not happy. You know, she spent a summer unwittingly spying for the Chinese. A storm was rolling in, which could lead to a flash flood considering they were next to a ravine, so they take a shortcut and end up getting stuck. They try to pull the truck out, but the only tree nearby isn't strong enough, though luckily Tilly has finished taking pictures of the blue bonnets and showed up just in time. <laughs> You boys need some help? So they hook the truck up to the RV and pull it out of the ravine, with Hank trying to show that this was an example of why she shouldn't be out there on her own, though she points out that she wasn't the one that needed to be saved. This is what I was talking about, Mom. The road is a dangerous place. It's too easy for someone like you to get into trouble out here. I wasn't in trouble. You two boys are the ones who got yourselves stuck. I saved you. Well, uh... Sure, this time. Tilly explains that she understands Hank worrying about her because of her age, but Hank corrects her and informs her that he worries about her because he thinks that she's an idiot. I know you think I'm an old lady, Hank, but I'm as sharp as I ever was. I don't worry about you because you're old. I worry about you because... because you're an idiot. What? And he gives a few reasons why he feels that way, including her sending gold to a guy on TV. You make stupid decisions, Mom. You married Cotton. You started dating Chuck before you broke up with Gary. You sent your gold to some guy on TV. I'm sick of it. Tilly is shocked at Hank's opinion and for how long that he's felt that way. Have you always felt this way? Well, just maybe for the past 30 years or so. Huh but she sticks to her guns based off of what she wants in life. You know what? Maybe you're right. Maybe I am an idiot. Who cares? I do. 
When you make a mistake, I have to pick up the pieces. And then she gives a pretty good speech about how she can live her life the way she wants, which is true, and that the consequences are hers to deal with and not Hank's. No, you don't. I want to live on my own terms, Hank. I want to have fun while I can, let the pieces fall where they may. Some things will work out well, some won't. At least it won't be boring. Tilly and Chuck make up after he says that he accepts who she is no matter what. We can be at the Mark Twain Festival by sunrise. Don't worry, Hank. I'll be okay. And the last we see of Tilly, she and Chuck are heading to Sulphur Springs for the Mark Twain Festival. Which is not a real thing, by the way. Sulphur Springs is a real place, but they don't have a Mark Twain Festival. All the while towing Hank's truck behind them because it's still attached. Wait, no, 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 my, my truck! Idiots. So, overall, Tilly is a smart woman. She's just a tad naive. She sent gold to a guy on TV, inadvertently spied for the Chinese, married Cotton, cheated on Gary, and then married the other guy after a short courtship, just to name a few examples of her rash decision making. But she is her own woman and she lives the life she wants to live. And after having to deal with the mental and emotional abuse from Cotton for so long, I mean, really, can we blame her? So, is this a foot or a table I'm touching? I'm kicking it right now. Foot? Table? Must be table. 